talking about uh, Chico Miller. Through the generation. So this is a reporting on joint work with Frederic Rochon and David Scher. So the goal is to show that Rademeister torsion is equal to analytic torsion on manifolds with fibered cusp ends. So I'll start the talk by uh, reminding you what all of the terms in the goal mean, and uh, then I'll tell you what we did and how we did it. So uh, let me start with Rademeister torsion. So this is a topological invariant introduced in 1935 by Rademeister. And uh, the goal when he introduced it was to distinguish lens spaces. So as you know, lens spaces are quotients of S3 where you identify two points if, um, if they're related in this way. So here you have uh, two integers, p and q, that are co-prime. You have a primitive p root of unity. So you think of S3 as sitting inside um, C2, right, the uh, complex plane. Um, and you act by a primitive p root of unity on the first one and by uh, the qth power on the second factor. And um, these were introduced by Tietze in 1908, uh, so very early in the story of algebraic topology. And they were used as uh, test cases for any new algebraic topological invariant. Uh, and one thing that happens is that the homotopy groups and the homology groups only depend on P. So uh, they're not strong enough to distinguish uh, different lens spaces. And Rademeister's idea was that if you wanted to distinguish these, if you wanted to find Q, you had to look at the universal cover and how the fundamental group acts on the universal cover. Right, so that's uh, what Rademeister torsion is uh, meant to try to capture. So let me tell you how you define it. Uh, so let's, following Milnor, let's talk about um, Rademeister torsion for complexes. So the idea is to, to generalize the determinant. So let's say you start with a very simple complex. Right, where you just have two non-zero terms. So then you have an isomorphism. And if you were to choose bases of Cn and Cn minus 1, then this um, map would be given by a matrix, and you could take the determinant. Right? Uh, of course, it's going to depend on the bases. And you can think of it as just telling you how this map changes the bases as you push it forward. In the general case, We want to do something similar. So we pick bases of each term. We pick bases of the image of d bar and of the homology. And then we define the, um, say, logarithm of Rademeister torsion uh, with respect to 
some of these bases as uh, one half some logarithm of the determinant of the change of basis matrix. So I think I want the b's first, and I've left out a sign. So I'll denote the change of basis matrix like this, where you have your, your chosen basis of each complex, each um, finite dimensional uh, vector space, I should have said. And you compare it with um, the bases for the image of the map uh, and the basis for the homology. As I've indicated with the notation, it doesn't depend on uh, the choice of basis of the image, but it does depend on the other two choices. Okay, so that's how you get um, Radermeister torsion for a complex, Radermeister torsion for a space, a simplicial complex, finite simplicial complex. Uh, what we're going to do is uh, pick a representation of the fundamental group. Um, and <clears throat> following work of, of Werner, Mueller, let's demand that a B, uh, alpha be unimodular. So the determinant always has um, size 1. <clears throat> and then we're going to define our complex by uh, taking the tensor product of the um, the complex on the universal cover uh, tensored over c pi 1 with uh, cn. This is the complex. The um, We have a a natural choice of basis by using lifts of the cells of x um, to the universal cover and using the canonical basis of Cn. <clears throat> and we define logarithm of Radermeister torsion of x alpha and a choice of basis of homology to be the um, logarithm of the of the complex with its chosen basis bases okay so this is how you get a uh, radermeister torsion for a complex for a space and uh, this invariant has many important properties so on the one hand it, it worked great for lens spaces um, Radermeister was able to show that it's invariant under subdivision and um, that it gave a complete um, classification of lens spaces combinatorially. In the 60s, it was shown that it's actually a homeomorphism invariant. And consequently, it actually gives you a classification of lens spaces up to homeomorphism. Um, another very useful property is that it satisfies an inclusion-exclusion principle, or Meyer via Torres. Which says that if you have a short exact sequence of complexes, and you pick compatible bases, <clears throat> then the Radermeister torsion of the one in the middle is the sum of the Radermeister torsions on the ends if there's no homology. If there is homology, well, that's also a complex. And so you can take its Radermeister torsion, and that fits into the formula. So this is great. This is just like the Euler characteristic, for example. And so you could look at that and think that uh, Radermeister torsion must be counting something. 
And indeed, uh, Freed uh, showed that if you're working on uh, hyperbolic spaces, then it is counting something. It's in some sense counting closed GT6. And there's been a lot of work in that direction um, relating Rademeister torsion with Selbrig's eta functions and Ruel's eta functions and uh, generally with dynamics. Um, another nice property that Milner established is that this generalizes the Alexander polynomial. of a knot. So if you have a knot, you look at the complement of the knot in the sphere, then uh, the Rademeister torsion of that with appropriate choice of coefficients gives you the Alexander polynomial. And so uh, Rademeister torsion is actually um, something being actively studied in knot theory, uh, particularly yet bounds on the uh, genus of the Seifert surface of a knot. And uh, they refer to Rademeister torsion as generalized Alexander polynomials. But of course, the most important property for us is uh, something um, Werner was just talking about, that this, uh, there is an analytic expression for Rademeister torsion. So this is known as analytic torsion. and is, was defined by Ray and Singer in 1971. So, as Werner was saying, um, Ray and Singer noticed that you could write the Rademeister torsion of a space as um, one half some. So say you have uh, your complex as above, and you put inner products on each of the finite dimensional vector spaces. Then you can um, follow Hodge theory to define some combinatorial Laplacians, These just be matrices in this case. And And in terms of those combinatorial Laplacians, you can write Rademeister torsion uh, in this way, where here um, we're comparing the basis of cohomology now that we started with, with an orthonormal basis with respect to the inner products. And so, um, staring at this formula, they decided that it, all you needed to do was to find the determinant of the Hodge Laplacian, and then you had a natural candidate for um, Rademeister torsion using uh, analysis. So, so that's analytic torsion. Uh, you just reinterpret this as being the Hodge Laplacian. And um, just for completeness, let me repeat uh, from Werner's talk the definition very quickly. Um, Ray and Singer started from the fact that if you have a finite sum of positive numbers, raise it to the minus s, take the derivative of s at is equal to zero, you get minus log of the product of the mu's. So if these were the eigenvalues of a matrix, this would give us the determinant of the matrix. So the idea is that if you define the zeta function of the Laplacian by summing over the spectrum the non-zero spectrum raised to minus s, then you want the determinant of the Laplacian to be e to the minus zeta prime of zero. Of course, there's a problem because zeta doesn't make any sense. It's zero with this definition. But you have another very nice identity um, that any positive real number using the Mellon transform can be written in this way. And hence, the zeta function can be written in terms of the trace of the heat kernel uh, 
where you subtract off the projection onto the zeroth eigenspace. Now, the trace of the heat kernel has an asymptotic expansion as t goes to zero, and you can use this asymptotic expansion to meromorphically continue this function to the entire complex plane, uh, much the same way we do in a first complex analysis course to meromorphically continue the gamma function. The, there's a potential pull at the origin, but one over gamma has a zero at the origin, uh, which cancels out that potential pull, lets you see that zero is a regular point of the Seda function, and then this definition makes sense where you've used the meromorphically continued Seda function. Okay, so with that, you have the determinant. With the determinant, this formula gives you the analytic torsion, and they conjectured that it was equal to the Rademeister torsion. Okay, so that conjecture uh, was established independently by Cheeger and Mueller in 78. If the representation is uh, unitary, it was extended by Mueller in 91, I think, to um, unimodular representations. And uh, I think the same year, Bismuth and Sang uh, discussed what happens for an arbitrary representation, uh, so they're no longer equal, arbitrary flat bundle. They're no longer equal, but you can write down uh, an expression for the difference. And, and well, there's been a ton of work extending this uh, since then. Uh, there's a, a very beautiful proof of the equality due to Maxime Braberman. Um, most important for us is uh, proof of Andrew Hassel in 95, uh, where he, he recovered the, the usual uh, Cheeger Mueller theorem for closed manifolds, but he also proved um, that they were equal for manifolds with cylindrical ends. And his method of proof was to use an analytic surgery that he had developed with um, Rafe Mazzeo and Richard Melrose. And uh, that's very much the approach we're going to follow. In, in a different context. Okay. Okay, great. So those are the two sides of the equality we want to study. Now, I want to tell you about the spaces where we want to study this. So manifolds with fibered cusp ends. So we're going to be working on a manifold that's non-compact, but that is equal to the interior of a manifold with boundary. And the boundary of this manifold is going to participate in a fiber bundle of closed manifolds. <clears throat> we'll be interested in metrics that in a color neighborhood of the boundary take, at least asymptotically, the following form. So here x is a boundary defining function. By which I mean a a uh, smooth function on the closed manifold that is uh, non-negative is equal to zero precisely on the boundary, and it only vanishes to first order there. Right, so as the name indicates, it de defines the boundary. And then this metric is, um, if you were to extend this uh, fiber bundle structure trivially to a collar neighborhood, then this is just a submersion metric with respect to that extended uh, fiber bundle. And uh, the fibers are hyperbolic cusp-like 
ends. Uh, what this looks like is that you have some, some cylindrical core, and then the, as you go towards infinity, which is x equal to zero, the fibers of the fiber bundle are collapsing down to this cylindrical core. So you have some sort of cusp decay like this. Right. Two extreme cases are when, um, when z is a point, then this is uh, asymptotically cylindrical. So this is called a, a B metric, and this is the context of Richard Melrose's B calculus. Uh, and it's in this context that Andrew Hassel has uh, studied analytic torsion and shown equality with uh, appropriate Radomeister torsion. If you put y equal to a point, then this includes hyperbolic manifolds of finite volume, non-compact. Um, so, for example, uh, the ones um, Werner Mueller was just telling us about. Uh, notice we don't require um, the fiber to be a torus, as would happen if we had constant curvature. Uh, here, um, the analytic torsion uh, has been studied a lot in recent times, uh, as we just heard. And the, um, uh, besides our result that I'll get to about uh, equality of analytic torsion and Radermeister torsion, uh, simultaneously there was a result of uh, Boris Wertmann on, um, on this equality. And uh, previously there was a, a closely related result of Jonathan Foth. Um, okay, uh, if you, if neither C nor Y is a point, then it, this uh, class of metrics includes um, most locally symmetric spaces of real rank one. Right? If you want to handle all of them, you have to allow an iterated vibration at the boundary, and uh, a calculus for that sort of thing has been developed by uh, Daniel Greaser and uh, Eugenie Hunziker. Okay, so those are the um, spaces we want to study, and we want to study Radomeister torsion and analytic torsion in this context. So uh, there are two good choices for for Radomeister torsion. On the one hand, you have the um, compact manifold with boundary, and so you can talk about its Radomeister torsion. On the other hand, there is a naturally associated stratified space, uh, which is what you get if you uh, collapse the fibers. So if you had a locally symmetric space, uh, you have the borel serre compactification and the reduced borel serre compactification. And uh, there is a very interesting uh, Radermeister torsion on stratified spaces due to Arpana Dar. So she defined uh, Radermeister torsion with respect to a perversity on stratified spaces. And she also defined um, an analytic torsion on stratified spaces uh, using incomplete edge metrics or wedge metrics or admissible metrics, they were called yesterday. Um, and she conjectured that these two things would be equal and this conjecture is still wide open uh, in fact, uh, we believe our result is the first analytic expression uh, for um, DAR's um, intersection, Radermeister torsion. Okay, so it turns out that these two Radermeister torsions are very closely related, and our result can be expressed using either one. In terms of analytic torsion, then as we saw last time, uh, last talk, uh, if you actually have a locally symmetric space, then you can use the algebraic structure to um, to write the the um, to regularize the trace of the heat kernel and um, 
and work out what the analytic torsion should be. Uh, in, in the general context, you don't have uh, that algebraic structure, um, but, um, and you need to do something because, as, as we just heard, the, um, the hodge Laplacian twisted with a flat bundle usually has a continuous spectrum. And so neither expression for this eta function makes sense. The, you can't sum if you have continuous spectrum, and uh, the heat kernel is not trace class. So fortunately, the, um, you can define a renormalized trace following a prescription of Richard Melrose by taking, by, for example, truncating the manifold, Kazunite, as we saw in last talk, or alternately, um, what you can do is take a power of the boundary defining function and multiply the heat kernel by that. If um, what you want to do is something very similar to how you meromorphically continued the SATA function, you want to say that this has an expansion in X so that this trace will be meromorphically continued uh, in C. And uh, it turns out that it does. Uh, this is due to Vaillant. Vaillant gave a construction of the, the heat kernel in this context. Uh, and showed that it is what's called polyhomogeneous on a manifold with corners. So this is a, a nice replacement for um, smoothness on a manifold with corners, where you end up with expressions like the ones that uh, Werner was showing us for uh, short-time asymptotics in the previous talk. You have powers of boundary-defining functions and logs. So th the heat kernel itself has such a polyhomogeneous expansion that lets you meromorphically continue this, this trace, z equal to zero might have a pole, but that's okay. You just ignore the pole and take the finite part, and that's a renormalized trace. Uh, Vaillant's construction also shows that you have a meromorphic, um, sorry, polyhomogeneous expansion as t goes to zero for the heat kernel, which, so the trace inherits a um, short-time asymptotic expansion which you can use to meromorphically continue the SATA function. Now, the uh, trace, the short-time asymptotics involve log t, and so the origin will no longer necessarily be a regular point. But that's okay. You take the determinant to be minus, and then you just take the part of the Taylor expansion of the SATA function at the origin that you would have taken if, um, if it were regular. So with this definition, you can make sense of analytic torsion in this context, and that's the analytic torsion we want to compare with these Rademeister torsions. OK. So that's the context. Uh, let me tell you what we're able to do. So let's say that n is uh, odd dimensional. Let's say that y is even dimensional. We're going to pick a bundle, a flat bundle, with unimodular holonomy. Alpha, we're going to endow n with a metric, and um, for simplicity, uh, we're going to assume that this metric is even, by which I mean that in some color neighborhood, you have something that's asymptotically like this. You can have uh, more terms in the Taylor expansion, but we require that only x squared shows up, no odd powers of x. We're going to demand something similar for a bundle metric on F. We're also going to demand that it's even. In this case, that has a, a nicer interpretation. You can just think that you take the manifold with boundary, you double it over the boundary, and then we want F and the metric to extend to be smooth on the double. Right? And that's what this evenness gives you. And then we are going to impose some uh, cohomological restriction 
on the flat bundle, namely we want all of the cohomology of the, um, the fibers with coefficients in the flat bundle to vanish. So we want the fibers of the vibration at infinity to be acyclic with respect to this representation. So with those assumptions, we show that the logarithm of analytic torsion, NGD, FGF, and some basis of cohomology, um, given as a basis of L2 harmonic forms, is equal to the Radermeister torsion of um, n bar relative to its boundary with respect to alpha plus one half uh, the Radermeister torsion of the boundary. I'll leave out decorations, just the boundary. And you can write this in terms of. Um, At the intersection, Radermeister torsion but then you need to subtract the um, intersection Radermeister torsion of a mapping cylinder of the fiber bundle map and then you have this same term. Okay, so we get an equality of analytic torsion and Radermeister torsion uh, in, uh, under these assumptions. Um, of course, if, since n is odd dimensional, the boundary of n is even dimensional, and uh, we're used to uh, even dimensional spaces not having uh, analytic torsion, Radermeister torsion, but of course that's only when you have uh, unitary representations and the bundle metric is compatible with the uh, flat connection. In, under uh, that hypothesis, this term would vanish. Um, yes? Uh, since, uh, since your wit, uh, it's, it's either upper middle or lower middle, yeah. But it is middle, yeah. Mm. Okay, and then if we specialize to uh, cusps, we can weaken the hypothesis and still have a nice formula. I should say that our, we have a theorem in, in much greater generality where you, you only assume wit, but it's not nearly as nice to state. So now assume that y is a point, so that we're uh, in the what look like um, hyperbolic cusps, although they don't actually have to be hyperbolic. And with the same assumptions, let's just replace um, the acyclicity with just a wit condition. In this case, the analytic torsion has the same terms as above, plus, no, minus, some so a linear combination of Betty numbers of the fiber but the coefficients of the linear combination are not as simple as you might have hoped. It is log two over four.
So that's the expression for a unimodular representation. And um, it looks a little bit nicer in the, um, if it's actually a unitary representation in that you can put some of these terms together to get an Euler characteristic showing up, um, but not all of them. So it's still complicated, uh, even in the unitary case. OK, and so uh, let me tell you how we prove it. <clears throat> so a very useful fact about uh, analytic torsion and randomized torsion is that they don't depend on orientation. So it's very uh, standard to um, study it uh, and take the, the manifold and double it as uh, part of how you study it. So we do that. We take the manifold with with boundary, and we double it across the boundary to get a smooth manifold. So the context we're working in is you have some smooth manifold M with a hypersurface, and we assume the hypersurface has this um, fiber bundle structure. And then we study a family of metrics on this smooth manifold that in a tubular neighborhood of the hypersurface have the following form asymptotically. So we have a parameter epsilon. And when epsilon is positive, there's no singularity at x equal to 0. So you have a smooth metric on a smooth manifold. And when epsilon goes to zero, well, away from H, you are converging to a, a metric that looks like this. And then something, something is happening at H. Right? So of course, for epsilon positive, since you just have a closed manifold, you have uh, the Cheeger Mueller theorem. And you have equality of analytic torsion, Rademeister torsion. So the idea is just to understand what happens to both sides when epsilon goes to zero. <clears throat> so as an example of the sort of argument we use, um, this starts out being defined, if you like, if you throw in the parameter on something that looks like this. There's x, there's epsilon. And you have something terrible happening uh, when x is equal to 0 and epsilon is equal to 0. So to understand what's happening, we do a radial blow up of the sort we heard about a lot yesterday. So we call this the surgery space. And this is what you get by blowing up h at epsilon equal to 0 which means that you take, take this manifold away and replace it with its inward-pointing spherical normal bundle. So now, when epsilon is equal to 0, we have two, two spaces. Whether they're connected or disconnected depends on the topology of, of m away from h. Uh, but you have these two spaces. This one you can identify with m minus h. And this metric is converging there to give you a, um, a, a cusp metric, a fibered cusp metric. And then this other space, well, this looks like um, the compactified normal bundle of uh, h. And uh, I'm assuming that we have a, a two-sided uh, hypersurface, so the normal bundle is going to be trivial, and this will just be h cross r compactified. <clears throat> now, we also have to uh, change the, the vector bundle. So we replace the, um, the tangent bundle. Well, let's go directly with the cotangent bundle. with a surgery 
cotangent bundle. And uh, this has is locally spanned by um, dx over square root of x squared plus epsilon squared. Then you have square root of x squared plus epsilon squared dc and dy. So this is um, using the, the uh, Sayre Swan theorem, or, or more concretely, you can use uh, Melrose's construction of rescaled tangent bundles, uh, rescaled bundles. Um, and you can come up with uh, a bundle that coincides, is canonically isomorphic, to the usual cotangent bundle away from this new hypersurface, but um, as sections of this bundle, these square roots are not coefficients. They're part of the basis element, right? So, for example, this form, a form like this, does not vanish on the new hypersurface as a section of this bundle, while, of course, it does vanish as a section of this bundle. Okay. So when you do that, um, the Duram operator Uh, you can interpret it as acting on differential forms over here, uh, so exterior powers of this bundle. And then this has uh, very well behaved uh, normal operators on these two faces. On, on this face, you're going to get the Duram operator of the D metric, that this fibered cusp metric, whereas on this face, Actually, the, the model operator you get is a B operator on Y cross R. So here you see that really the, um, it is the, the stratified space where you've collapsed the fibers that's really um, like the correct geometry for, for this metric. It's what you end up seeing. Okay. Yeah, you end up on, on the stratum cross R. Of course, twisted by the um, vertical harmonic forms. Okay, and the reason I wanted to emphasize um, that Vaillant's results uh, that allow the, um, the determinant to be defined in the fibered cusp uh, context rely on showing that the heat kernel is polyhomogeneous on, on appropriate manifold with corners is that that's exactly what we proceed to do in, um, in this surgery context. So we, we study the resolvent and the heat kernel, but we replace you know, the, pla the spaces where these would, the Schwartz kernels of these operators would regularly be found. We replace these with manifolds with corners Uh, obtained and denoted the double surgery space and the heat surgery space, um, on which the the operators uh, are polyhomogeneous, uh, which means that they have nice asymptotic expansions at all faces. And this somehow resolves the singularity or lets you understand exactly how things degenerate. So. By doing that, we're able to show that, for example, the resolvent 
extends uniformly from um, lambda, and I guess I actually wonder, or to a meromorphic family. of bounded operators, um, the, the wit assumption in either case is enough to show that the discrete, that near zero you have discrete spectrum. So we don't have this problem that Werner was referring to of accumulation of eigenvalues near zero. You always have uh, a neighborhood where you have finitely many. And uh, thanks to this being uniform, you can show that the number of eigenvalues is you know, not just finally many, but bounded, uniformly bounded in epsilon. Um, similarly, the heat kernel, well, let me just say what we get for the trace of the heat kernel. So the trace of the heat kernel has asymptotic expansions. And what you get is the renormalized trace of the two model operators, plus something depending on log epsilon, plus something that vanishes with epsilon. This is what happens if epsilon goes to 0 while t stays bounded. If you let t go to 0 while epsilon stays bounded, then of course you just get the usual short time asymptotic expansion. And if you were to let both of them go to 0, then you get something that looks like this. This is as they both go to 0. And here, rho is the square root of epsilon squared plus t. So of course, the result is actually more precise than this, in that there's actually a manifold with corners on which the trace is polyhomogeneous. But this is one way of, of seeing what you get. There's actually three um, boundary hypersurfaces in this manifold with corners. And this is the sort of expansion you get at one of them at, and the, at the other two. Um, so as you can see, the, um, the renormalized trace of the fibered cusp metric, which is what we're interested in for the analytic torsion, uh, is precisely the limit that you get from this trace when epsilon goes to 0, as long as t is bounded away. So the, um, the proof of these theorems now just consists in understanding how these asymptotics uh, fit together in the definition of analytic torsion um, under the, the assumptions. And you can see the reason why this acyclicity um, is so useful is that it makes this term vanish just because the, the bundle on which it would act is, has rank 0. OK, that's a good place to stop. Thank you very much. What, a what about the topological part? I mean, you, you also have to look at the degeneration of that. Yes. Part. Uh, thank you. So um, for the topological part, uh, so of course, topologically, there's nothing happening when epsilon goes down to zero until you get to epsilon equal to zero. So uh, what it comes down to is the, um, and that's the reason I wrote down, Milnor's um, inclusion-exclusion principle, or the meyer viatoris principle. So it comes down to writing down uh, good um, long exact sequences relating the cohomology uh, of uh, m without h to all of m uh, to um, to understand what happens to the Radermeister torsion part. It gets a lot more complicated when you only have the width assumption, 
because then you have to worry about uh, the small eigenvalues. So eigenvalues that are converging to zero, and then, um, and then again, some, some uh, well-chosen long exact sequences uh, help you get control on those. The second equality there is, is it, uh, how do you get that? I mean, uh, so you, you get this from this by relating the, um, the intersection homology in middle perversity with the, um, with the relative and absolute uh, cohomologies using, um, you know, um, household Hunter Kerman sale, for example. You have to extend it a little because our coefficients don't, don't extend to the um, singular stratum, but, but that's fine. Where do we use this condition? Yes? Yeah, so we use it, uh, it, it cancels out this term, so we don't have uh, to, to, to worry about what the analytic torsion, or how this contributes to the limit of the analytic torsion, and it also rules out small eigenvalues. So there are no eigenvalues converging to zero that were not already zero. I'm sorry? So, yeah, for manifold with boundary without the cis uh, vibrations, and I think even H0 uh, is not uh, equal to zero for the boundaries, and the small equilibrium part can be, we can be very well understand. And in your case, it uh, it's much more difficult. As, so, it is in so sorry, I didn't catch all of that. But in the case of manifolds with boundary, yeah. the uh, you, you I mean, here you have a, a sorry here you have a, a complete metric, right? So yeah. you have very different issues to when you have an incomplete metric, right? You yeah. don't have to choose domains, uh. and um, and you know, uh, I'm not yeah. sure what yeah, the question is. Sorry, the largest scaling and the Small equilibrium part of your related to scattering matrix, yeah? Uh, so that's yeah. one way of approaching yeah. things. Yeah. Uh, if, uh, if the continuous spectrum were going all the way down to zero, yeah. we would definitely need to deal with the scattering matrix. Yeah. Because, for example, that's, that's how you understand the limit as t goes to infinity of the yeah. heat kernel, right? Yeah. But because we have these um, uh, acyclicity assumption or even just the width assumption, yeah. uh, that tells us that there is some neighborhood of zero where you do not have continuous spectrum. And so we don't have to worry about the scattering matrix. Yeah, yeah, this is my question. Yes, this is what I mean. So in that's general, your, if you do not make the assumption that H is zero, then the scattering matrix should, uh, should come in. in sense. Oh, yes, what would happen if we didn't do that? Oh, yeah. So, yes, if we did not have the width assumption, then you would have infinitely many eigenvalues converging to zero. And then, um, well, then, uh, it's sort of clear what you have to do, but it's a lot more complicated. And the reason it's sort of clear what you have to do is that in the asymptotically cylindrical case, it, it was worked out. Uh, so f there was, there's a beautiful paper of Mattel Melrose on um, um, analytic surgery and the eight invariant. And in that paper, they assume that you have a spectral gap near zero. But then together with Andrew Hassel, they consider the case where you don't have a spectral gap at zero. And so you have, um, um, lots of small eigenvalues creating continuous spectrum all the way down to zero, and they're able to work out uh, what the limit is in that case. But it is quite a bit more complicated, and as you say, it involves a scattering matrix. Other questions? <laughs>